Good morning, everybody. Good It'll morning. Be a good pleasure and happy thing during the festivals to introduce Professor Kavita Manan. She's a professor and head of nutrition and dietics program at Symbiosis Institute. Symbiosis Institute in Pune is one of the best known systems in the country for various subjects, including nutrition. And also she functions as a leading member of Nutrition Society of India. And besides this, she is a researcher experienced more than 23 years in teaching and academia. Her research mainly is nutritional epidemiology, maternal child nutrition, and particularly micronutrient research. This background of her is the reason why I have requested her to come and tell all of us what are the micronutrients that are important for seniors so that they can take and maintain good health. Certainly when we go to the doctors, the very concept of micronutrients is not well known to them in terms of multivitamins, etc. But there's so much out there in the field today. Normal people without yes. research, without experience yes. in that field cannot give proper guidance. Therefore, I requested Professor Kavita Minan to give us what kind of micronutrients to take, how, when, and what will the what will be the outcome? Professor Kavita Minan, with this very, very brief introduction, mm -hmm. I request you to present to our team about your research ideas and practical things for them to follow. We hope that another time we'll have a full scale introduction of people to the people from your side. Thank you. Good morning all. Indeed, thank you, Professor Rao, Dr. Rao, and uh, welcome all of you to this session. Um, what I thought today as I discussed the topic with Dr. Rao is that I'll give you a brief background of these uh, micronutrients, which is very well talked about. And probably after my presentation, I can take some of the question answers, which actually would be much more useful, I guess, that you, you know what to use, how to use, and when to use these micronutrients. So thank you. It is nice to connect with uh, like-minded people who think about health as well as wellness. And micronutrients is very much indeed required for elderly population. Now, I don't consider this group as elderly probably because the definitions are changing and the longevity is increasing, the lifespan is increasing. So I feel you all are a group of middle-aged group of people, but your health becomes much more relevant here. So with these words, let me start off with my presentation. These are just a kind of um, introduction to um, give you a concept of what micronutrients are and also to let you know like how we need to uh, eat food so that all different types of micronutrients are available to you all when you follow a balanced diet. Now, as a requirement from my university, I say that I, does, I don't endorse any kind of brands, nor I encourage you all to consume nutrients in the form of supplements. So let me be very uh, open about it. Um, primarily because we believe that you require micronutrients in a supplement form only when you are sick or in a convalescent stage. Otherwise, you should be able to meet your requirements through a balanced diet. So with that disclaimer, let me start off with my presentation today. If you think you would like to have more of an interaction, I am open to it. 
But if let me give you a background, then probably I can take you through the different insights that are updated today based on the uh, based on the evidence based practice that nutritionists um, go about in dealing with micronutrient deficiencies. So, the first question that comes to everyone's mind is, what is micronutrient? This is many a times I get this question when I conduct such session as that, why is that this is so important? So when we consider many of the nutrients what we consume, the difference is that food we consume are rich in many nutrients. Some are available in larger quantity, whereas some are available in very minute quantities. Nevertheless, all of these nutrients have their own specific functions, as well as they are very much needed for a healthy life. So in food, you have both macro as well as micronutrients. We call some nutrients like protein, fat, carbohydrate as macro, primarily because we require them in larger quantity. However, we require some of those nutrients in very minute quantity, despite that they are required in minute quantity, we often miss them in our diet. And hence, they cause problem to our system. So, to put it very simply, they are the nutrients that are required in very small quantity. We call them as micronutrients. But these nutrients are very important in the metabolism of macronutrients. So it is a kind of joint function they do. On one side, you require macronutrients to give you energy, protein, carbohydrate for the entire energy metabolism. Whereas to release the energy from carbohydrate, protein, and fat, you require micronutrients, the absence of which you have a greater challenge especially among children and elderly in terms of growth and development, and also many of the important body functions. So to say that they have a very significant role in the metabolic activities of the body. And primarily, micronutrients are consisting of vitamins and minerals. So if you see this slide, you will see that there are, important, there are many, many of them, but Primarily, we say that these 12 vitamins are very important. Similarly, we have set of micronutrients in microminerals as well as macrominerals, which I will take you through. So as I mentioned, micronutrients are primarily consisting of vitamins and minerals. Now, let us focus on vitamins. Now, these vitamins can be of two types, that is water-soluble vitamins and fat-soluble vitamins. Now, the distinctness is very important to consider here because the water-soluble vitamins cannot be stored in the body. So this is something important to keep in our mind, and that is why the relevance of daily consumption of some of these um, um, foods are important that we get all these vitamins. Whereas if you consume in the form of supplements in larger quantity, they usually get flushed out of the body because they cannot be stored in the body. Now, the essential role of these important water-soluble vitamins are they, they are important for release of energy from carbohydrate, protein, and fat. On the contrary, so some examples of water-soluble vitamins are B-complex vitamin. We say B-complex primarily because you have a group of B vitamins together. Like for example, you have B1, B2, B3, and then B6, B12. Many of those all are included under B-complex vitamins. And then comes the most important antioxidant, that is the vitamin C that we usually get it from fruits and vegetables. On the contrary, we have a group of vitamins which are called as fat-soluble vitamins. Now, the advantage of these vitamins, as well as I would say disadvantage for those who consume too much of it is that they are stored in the liver and fatty tissues for future use. For example, vitamin A, B, E, and K are popularly known as fat-soluble vitamins. Now, these are very important from the point of view of immune system 
proper bone development, proper vision, and protection of cells from damage. Now, let me give you some insight of this to the COVID scenario we had. We know that we, we had a big pandemic, which actually we, I would say that we all survived thanks to the vaccine that is protecting us. Now, the most important thing that came uh, during this period was there were many people running behind for supplements and uh, minerals, or I would say minerals and vitamins to improve the immunity. At that point of time, we didn't have much of information related to how these vitamins and minerals are helping the body. But of late, with the existing data, what we are finding is that those who had suboptimal status of these nutrients, they had a higher risk of COVID infection. So many of the things we learn as we go along, but the thing is that we have to be careful in consuming these vitamins, especially in the chemical form, that's a supplement form. But what we should aim is to have them in the sources that is most suitable to the body, that is from the fruits, vegetables, and other food items. Now, let me talk about minerals, just to give you a prelude to it. Now, these are required, some of these minerals, again, minerals can be classified into two, that is macro minerals and micro minerals. Now, these macro minerals are actually required in larger amounts compared to the uh, micro minerals. And some of them include calcium, which of course you may all know that these are required for the structure and function of bones. And then comes the phosphorus, the cell membrane structure, magnesium for enzyme reaction. Whenever there is a release of energy that is happening in the body, magnesium is very important. And in the recent years, the role of magnesium is getting highlighted in prevention of CVDs as well. So there is much more roles that are attributed to magnesium beyond what we are actually thinking now. Then comes sodium, which is important for fluid balance and maintenance of blood pressure. Then chloride, again, it is actually important for the secretion of digestive juices. And potassium, the balance of sodium and potassium is very important. When sodium actually is more into fluid balance and maintaining blood pressure, potassium is involved in the nerve impulse transmission and muscle function. For example, our heart beat originates with the functioning of a sinoauricular node. Now, for initiating this function, you require a balance between sodium and potassium for that the contraction of the muscle take place. So you can understand what is actually the importance of these micronutrients have in our day-to-day -day life. And then comes sulfur, which is present in all living tissues, and they are also very important. Now, I will take you through trace minerals, which is very important, actually. They are very, they are required in very small quantity, and that's the fun part of it. Even despite requirement is in very micrograms, we often don't meet them because some of the food items we omit in our daily diet, that is actually causing challenge of achieving the requirements for these trace minerals. So primarily, these include iron, manganese, copper, zinc, iodine, fluoride, and selenium, which are very important from the point of view of group of people in US because many of the time, iodine deficiency is something that is badly affecting the US citizens and the population as such. Similarly, selenium deficiency is also increasing. The much better status we consider is iron, but there are newer studies that is indicating that people are anemic, although they may not be too much of iron deficient. So there are conflicting reports that are coming up, but I'll tell you what we can do to address this. Now, talking about macro minerals, I talked about sodium. I said that it is important for fluid electrolyte balance and it supports the muscle contraction and nerve impulse transmissions. Now, identifying the source of food is important so that you can include them on a daily diet. For example, salt, soya sauce, bread, milk, meats, especially the processed meats, any of those 
um, uh, sauces that you use, ketchups, tomato sauce, or any of those uh, hummus, all these have I don't know. You want to go out? Let's go out. Any of these are rich in sodium. And then comes chloride, where fluid balance is important. At the same time, it helps in digestion through secretion of digestive juices. So again, similar kind of food products that are rich in sodium are also rich in chloride because sodium doesn't exist alone and it has to coexist together chloride. So sodium chloride, the sources remains the same. Now comes the potassium. As I mentioned, it's very important in maintaining the electrolyte balance, cell integrity, and also nerve impulse transmission and muscle contraction. The important sources are potatoes, vegetables, banana, strawberries, cod, milk, all these are good sources of potassium. Now, this is very important from the point of view of those who suffer from hypertension. You need to have a balance of sodium and potassium because if you are on antidiuretics, it is important that your intake of potassium is adjusted so that you don't have too much of potassium in the body that can often be fatal for you in, uh, if you don't observe it appropriately. Now, calcium is another important nutrient which is very much required for formation of bones, teeth, and also it helps in blood clotting. Now, the role of calcium is actually not individualistic. I would say these functions are often shared by vitamin D as well as phosphorus. So there is a group of vitamins and minerals that function together that actually improves the functioning of bones and teeth and also the formation. A deficiency of one of these nutrients actually impairs the synthesis of osteoblasts and osteoplasts, which are required for the normal bone formation. And same is with the teeth. And it is important that these vitamins and minerals are obtained concomitantly through the diet rather than getting them on an individualistic kind of a scenario because that doesn't help them to accrue the important material required for strengthening the bones. So the sources, if you look, you have milk, yogurt, cheese, any types of cheese, tofu, small fishes, which you consume as such, and then the green beans, spinach, broccoli, all these are good sources of um, uh, calcium. And then comes the phosphorus, which is also required together with calcium for bon bone formation. And also it maintains the acid-base balance within the system. So here you will see that all animal foods are rich in phosphorus. So uh, anything that is consumed in the form of animal food will give you phosphorus. Now, if you look at magnesium, you will see that it is important for mineralization of bone. And this is somewhere we often miss the boat because most of the time we take supplements which contain calcium, phosphorus, and probably vitamin, vitamin D. But we often miss other micronutrients which are even required for supporting functions that actually helps in improving the bone formation as well as the functioning of protein building and muscular contraction, nerve impulse transmission, and immunity. So green leafy vegetables, tomatoes, bananas, beans, cashews, halibut, all these are good sources of magnesium. And if you look at zinc, which is one of the important microminerals, very important from the pers uh, perspective of antioxidant, at the same time, very essential for skin, appropriate skin, as well as for immunity. And if you have deficiency of zinc, that itself can increase your risk for many of the infectious diseases. So all these, the especially when you talk about these micro minerals, they actually function it in a cohesive manner with many of the other nutrients. Now here, zinc and vitamin A work together in a way. And you can see that they are very essential from the point of view of immunity, antioxidant functions, and also improving the integrity of the system in terms of cellular functions. Now, the main important sources include the green vegetables and the lentils, oysters, and all the other seafoods, and meats, yogurt, cheese, all these are good sources of zinc. 
Now comes selenium, very important from the perspective of US population is that it is important for vitamin E and selenium to work together because they protect the body from generation of oxidative products. Now, why is that these oxidative products are produced in the body? They are produced as a result of metabolic activities which are regularly ongoing in our body. And if these oxidized products are not scavenged and destroyed, that actually can cause the onset of chronic diseases in us, leading to many of the future complications. So it is very, very important that we have a group of these micro, vitamin, micro minerals and vitamins working together to protect the system from free radical generation and scavenging these free radicals that are formed. If we are deficient in these nutrients, that actually changes the pathways of signaling in our body, leading, exposing us to more of um, chronic diseases, initiation of many of the chronic diseases. So the seafoods, meats, grains, all these are good sources of selenium. But those who are living in countries where you have a volcanic soil, which is not very good in iodine, selenium, and many other micro minerals, it is important to ensure that the food you consume have these. And if not, we may have to see what best can be done. Now, then comes the iodine. Iodine is very important for the normal thyroid function. It regulates the thyroid function through the synthesis of thyroxine. And thyroxine in turn actually helps in the development and metabolic rate. So if you have any derangements in thyroid, that itself is a set point for diabetes and many other endocrine disorders if you don't manage it properly because often thyroid access is something that regulates the entire metabolic or endocrine functions, that is the hormone functions. So it is imperative that you miss any kind, of, not to miss any kind of iodine sources in your diet and iodine is required in very minute quantity. And I'm sure that many of the breads that you are getting there are fortified with iodine or even the milk is fortified with iodine. And sometimes you can see iodine supplements are, now we recommend iodine supplements for pregnant women considering that the amount they get actually is low because the deficiency of iodine is known to cause um, um, cognitive disorders in the children. And that is something we worry about because the future generation is getting affected. So even a mild iodine deficiency is known to cause uh, impaired learning abilities in children of 8 to 10 years. So the effects are quite long lasting when you have iodine deficiency during the pregnancy phase. So mostly salt is an iodized salt is something that everyone could use seafoods and then bread, milk, cheese. These days now, these are iodized, iodine fortified. Then comes copper. Copper, iron are very important and they are very much important and function together because availability of copper is important for the absorption and utilization of iron and for the formation of hemoglobin and many of the enzymes that function in the metabolism. And similarly, you will see meats and meats, water, all these contain copper to a regular uh, uh, levels. Now, initially, the age-old practice of using copper vessels for cooking was something based on availability of copper. Now, we have moved away from copper, but now what we are seeing is also a deficiency of copper in the population. Same way, iron is very important and integral for the formation of hemoglobin that carries oxygen supply to the different parts of the body. So when you are deficient in iron, you end up with iron deficiency anemia, which is actually much a, much a kind of disturbance to the body because the functioning of the system is impaired during this time. So any of the non-vegetarian products and leafy vegetables, similarly, the nuts and oil seeds and green beans, tomato. Now, why it is important that and um, um, we consume food not individually, but rather in the form of a group. 
for example, when we make a tomato dal, tomato spinach dal, it's one of the best source of iron because the iron that is leached from spinach is actually well absorbed in the presence of tomato because tomato is rich source of vitamin C. So a natural source of vitamin C present together with protein and vitamin B12, folate, all these together enhances the absorption of iron. And this is something we practice as Indians or many of the time that we don't eat food individually, but we have mixed dishes, which are planned in such a way that they actually enhances the absorption of nutrients best utilized for the body for various metabolic pathways. And then comes the form of fluoride, which is very important from the point of view of bones, the teeth, and also it is important to have enough fluoride in terms of preventing the decay of the tooth. So fluoride, fluoridated drinking water, tea, seafoods, all these are important in terms of getting adequate amount of fluoride. Now, chromium is important especially when the insulin has to be secreted to maintain the homeostatic balance of glucose in the body. When you have chromium deficiency, the synthesis of insulin is affected and it is important that we prevent the deficiency to have normal quantities of insulin secreted so that there is no scope for developing diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance. Now, the food sources include the vegetable oils, liver, whole grains, cheese, nuts, all these provide you enough amount of chromium. The last one in this is, sorry, the second last one in this is the uh, manganese and then comes molybdenum. They are important from the point of view, uh, they are important to facilitate many of the cell processes and most of them are available in all types of foods. So deficiency is very less common in case of manganese and molybdenum. Now, some important things that we need to keep in mind when we talk about vitamins is that each vitamin has its own specific function. It's not like you eat vitamin A, it will take care of vitamin E and D and K because they are all fat soluble vitamin. That's a myth actually. Many people believe that vitamin, if we are taking vitamin A, it should take care of many other things. That doesn't happen. Each of them has its their own functions and they are very essential for our body. Absence of vitamins or an insufficient quantity of these vitamins in our system can cause a really catastrophic changes that exposes us to various types of diseases. And also you can see that they, requ they are required in very small quantities. And usually you can see that most of them are available from fresh fruits, vegetables, lentils, and many of those non-vegetarian products. Now, for example, vitamin B12 is the only vitamin that may not be available from the plant sources, but you can see that if you are using many of the fermented food items like yogurt or any other kind of fermented food items, you can see that majority of the time you have the vitamin B12 available. Only thing is that you need to consume it in adequate quantity to have that minimum quantity available. So the picture that I have included here is that some of these nutrients, what you see in the picture are available concomitantly together from one food source. For example, if you look at broccoli, you will see vitamin C and K can be combinedly available. Similarly, if you look at oranges, you get vitamin C and folic acid together. And if you look at avocados, which is plenty available in US, you can see that B2, B5, B6, all this comes through from one single source of food item. And if you look at nutrient-rich foods for a healthy diet, you can see that many of these give you adequate amount of nutrients by including appropriate portion sizes. Only important thing to remember here is not to overeat these items. At the same time, include a variety in the diet. Now, the diversity in the diet is so very important, so very important to ensure that you are getting all the nutrients. 
if your diet is very monotonous and you are not eating adequately di diverse diet, then it is natural that you end up with micronutrient deficiencies. Now, let's see some of the functions of vitamin A. As I mentioned, vitamin A is very important in terms of vision. Similarly, the skin texture as well as preventing the skin infections, the tooth growth, immunity and reproduction. This is very, very important. The food sources include all orange, green and yellow colored vegetables, fruits, apart from the beef, liver and all other organ meats. Then comes vitamin C, which is known as ascorbic acid commercially. So here you will see that Although we say vitamin D, calcium, phosphorus is important for bone formation, you will see you cannot miss vitamin C because that's very important for synthesis of collagen. This collagen is something that actually stabilizes our muscles and bones together and the joints have to be formed appropriately. You require the collagen together. So this actually tells you that it is not just that one nutrient do, does one function, but a single nutrient can have multiple function. And when they work together, that gives the best result in terms of various body functions. And the food important food sources include fruits and vegetables. Then comes vitamin D. The role of vitamin D has enormously increased post-COVID. And what we find that in the COVID patients, those who had suboptimal levels of vitamin D, they had a highest risk of COVID infection and even multiple infection. That's something that we have come through with the data that we have now. And also it is important for promoting the bone mineralization and self-synthesis. Now, of course, vitamin D is best available from sunlight. A regular um, uh, exposure to sunlight is something very essential. You can synthesize natural quantity, but those days when you have very hard winters, it is good to go with a supplement because sometimes whatever you consume may not be adequate to prevent um, uh, the vitamin D deficiency. So it's good to go with this supplement once a week or depending on the quantity that you are consuming. Then comes the vitamin B12. This is very important from the point of view of nerve cell maintenance. Now, if you don't have adequate amount of vitamin B12 fatigue, and similarly, the peripheral nervous tissues are affected badly, and that can cause many challenges. So it's important that vitamin B12 is consumed in adequate quantity. At the same time, vitamin B12 plays a very important role in one carbon transfer of uh, uh, methyl products, which means there are important compounds that are required to reduce the risk of coronary heart disease. And some of these are actually managed by vitamin B12. So it's very important to have the homocysteine and B12 balance in the body. Similarly, we have meats, poultry, fish, shellfish, milk, eggs. All these are ready sources of B12. But I would say those who are vegetarians, it is good to go with fermented products and make sure that you consume them on a regular basis because vitamin B12 cannot be stored in the body for a long period. And then comes vitamin E, that is the antioxidant, very powerful antioxidant, which protects the body from the free radical generation um, and the impact of free radical um, um, radicals on our system. So this is a very important for cell membrane stabilization, protecting the cell in its normal form. And the main sources of uh, vitamin C is that the wheat germ. So if you have the whole wheat germ being consumed, you can see that good amount of vitamin E can come through. And similarly, the polyunsaturated vegetable oil, sweet potatoes, tofu, all this provide you with uh, vitamin E. And the last one in this group is vitamin K, which is very important for the synthesis of blood clotting proteins. And it also regulates the blood calcium in the system. And you can see that the green leafy vegetables are the most important sources of vitamin K. If you consume normal amount of vitamin K, any green leafy vegetable, you can see that vitamin K deficiency can be avoided. 
Now, let me go through some of the deficiency symptoms because this would help you to identify the symptoms and do the needful at your end. So some of those, uh, what I would like to show you is that um, vitamin A deficiency, iodine deficiency, iron deficiency, what happens during zinc deficiency, and then I will talk about some of the folate deficiency importance in the maternal diets. So when I say micronutrient deficiencies, what I actually mean here, there are multiple deficiencies that you will see. But the five important ones that I am going to touch upon today is vitamin A deficiency and iodine, iron, zinc, and folate deficiencies. So here, when I talk about vitamin A deficiency, it actually changes the ocular, A, um, um, the eye functions. So when you have a deficiency of vitamin A, children often find it difficult to see in dim light. So this is the first thing any mother should be observing in young children because any kind of damage that happens to eye during this stage can have a long lasting impact. So it's important to prevent vitamin A deficiency in young children. At the same time, for older population, it is important to improve the immune functions and prevent anemia. So adequate amount of vitamin A is very, very important. What I am showing are the pictures that you will see here is the ocular changes that happens in terms of iron deficiency. So he, sorry, uh, vitamin A deficiency. What you are seeing here is actually, um, you will see that this a glistened spot, what you see here is called as biotot spots. Now, this is something, the initial stages you will see in small children, and especially those who are not um, given the oral dose of vitamin A. So if you see such kind of small spots on children's eye, it should be taken care and they should be immediately given the large dose of vitamin A to prevent the changes. Whereas if it gets advanced, you can see that these changes occur in the eye. And if it is not attended properly, the person loses vision. So this is something important to consider when vitamin A is actually considered. And this condition is called as xerophthalmia. Now, apart from that, what you see here is a kind of rash on your body. This is often the scenario what you see in adults where you can see vitamin A deficiency is indicated. Now, two things can attribute to it. One is the essential fatty acids deficiency. The other one is vitamin A deficiency. So ensure that when you see this, you are having adequate amount of vitamin A in your diets. And then if it is not treated, I mean, if it is not relieved, then you need to make a visit a physician. Now, normally, you, what we do actually when we see such symptoms is that we do the clinical evaluation. We look at the skin, eyes, and we see whether the child is growing appropriately. Now, the second thing what we do is we look at the serum retinol levels. We see whether it is less than 20 microgram per dl. That is indicative of deficiency. And then comes, we look at actually retinol to retinol binding protein levels as well which will actually tell us the diagnostic criteria for vitamin A deficiency. So for treating vitamin A deficiency in children, this is very important. And in adults, that you can directly give oral doses of vitamin A supplements. And once it is given, like every six months, at least one dose is helpful in preventing vitamin A deficiency in small children. Now, one thing I want to be very carefully talking about here is that there is a kind of concept that we use cod liver oils, the fish liver oils for young children. Often, many of the parents are very adamant that these children should be given um, um, fish oils, which are rich in vitamin A. And too much can cause toxicity. Many often it is not identified by the physicians correctly, but it is important that we do not indulge in too much consumption of vitamin A because that can result in toxicity. Remember, vitamin A is a fat-soluble vitamin. 
Now comes the role of vitamin D. And I want to show here something important is that vitamin D is not just related to the bones and teeth, but it has a larger role in the uh, um, prevention of many conditions. Now, the uniqueness of vitamin D is that vitamin D is more like a hormonal vitamin. So the role of endocrine functions actually is very, very important in preventing many of the chronic diseases that can occur due to insufficient use of vitamin D. Say, for example, infections, you will see that vitamin D actually causes a lot of challenge with infection, lung disease, autoimmune disease, cancers, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and then, of course, all the bone-related and the muscle-related weaknesses, as well as osteoarthritis and rickets. So it is very important that we manage vitamin D very carefully so that we, don't, we are not exposed to many of those challenges that we, it can create in our system. On the other hand, if you look, the sun is the major source of vitamin D and some of the medications and supplements can get rid of the vitamin D from the body. So you need to be careful about it if you are on any of these medications. Similarly, any malabsorption syndrome that can cause by various diseases, for example, the celiac disease, cystic fibrosis, Crohn's disease, liver diseases, these can reduce the absorption of vitamin D. And similarly, any kind of organ failure and obesity, that, that also can reduce the formation as well as absorption of vitamin D. It needs to be carefully handled. Now, what are the signs and symptoms of vitamin D? Because this occurs the majority of the time in adults. So I take a bit of time to explain this. Primarily, you will see mood swings. This is something that you will see in elderly populations, especially when they have a severe vitamin D deficiency or insufficiency of vitamin D. Similarly, the bone loss. Um, as such, there is a reduction in the bone density after, the 30, after we attain 32 years. And then it is aggravated if you have a sedentary life. Now, if you are actually having bone issues and it is actually causing trouble to you, ensure that you have adequate amount of vitamin D. Otherwise, it leads to the um, um, loss of bone density and then causes the challenge with walking and regular activities. Muscle cramps is another symptom where you can see vitamin D deficiency. The bone and joint pains, fatigue, common symptom. Many of us don't identify this to vitamin D deficiency, but you can see that this is one of the important thing that you will see here. Now comes the rickets in children. The moment you see any kind of bow legs, this is important that we consider and we check the child for vitamin D deficiency because that can actually cause paralysis in children if we don't attend them at the right time. Then comes vitamin C, all the fruits and vegetables provides you adequate amount of vitamin C. And it is important that we understand some of these symptoms due to vitamin C deficiency, primarily because fruits and vegetables are something many of the children and elderly don't consume. And this is where the real challenge also starts because micronutrients comes primarily from fruits and vegetables. So here you will see that the identifying bleeding gums, if you have bleeding gums, make sure you show to a doctor and take adequate amount of vitamin C. Similarly, preventing uh, gingivitis, which is an infection of the tooth, which actually leads to loss of tooth, rough, dry skin, joint and bone aches, similarly fatigue, depressions, and increased susceptibility to infection, muscle weakness, all this actually causes, are due to vitamin C deficiency and this needs to be attempted to, and this is broadly called as scurvy. Scurvy was identified in sailors because they never used to consume fruits and vegetables. And that, were, that came with the treatment, simple treatment of giving them orange juices or lemon juices, which actually cured. Scurvy. So it's important that we manage these. 
Now comes the beriberi, that is actually the deficiency of vitamin B1. Now here you have two different types of beriberi, that is one is dry beriberi without any edema, but whereas you will see there is higher risk of deficiency of thiamine when you have wet beriberi because that involves the cardiopathy. So it's important to make sure that we have adequate amount of uh, vitamin B1 in our diet. And often, if we don't treat them, it can end up in very serious conditions and that can cause even death of the person. So here you will see there is the wrist and foot drop that you see in case of dry beriberi, whereas edema that is present in case of wet beriberi, which classically differentiates them into two different groups. Now, these are common kind of um, uh, deficiencies that you see here, that's a riboflavin deficiency. Now, what it affects is the skin. Now, you will see the mouth is badly affected here. The one is the angular stomatitis on the angles, you will see swelling and pain, and then the redness occurs. If it is very severe, you can see the entire mouth is getting affected, which is very deep red in color, indicating that the condition of glossitis. And this is actually much dangerous. We need to treat it very easily or very quickly. Now comes pellagra. It's actually called as 3D's disease. Now, why we call this is it affects, it causes diarrhea, dermatitis, and dementia. So a deficiency of niacin should be prevented at any cost because the, it causes very severe kind of disease, often resulting in death. So naturally, as nutritionists, we call them as 4D's disease because if it is not treated, it leads to death, actually. So 4D's disease. And it's very important that we consume adequate amount of niacin in our, niacin in our diet because it has an implication on the heart also. So adequate amount of niacin is important. So this is a kind of scenario you can see. These are pictures from um, uh, African countries where we have conducted some research work. And you can see that these children have very severe dermatitis. And this is primarily due to pellagra or deficiency of niacin. Now, one of the most widely seen deficiency is iron deficiency, especially in the low and middle income countries and also in developed countries, especially among the low and middle income groups. So here you will see that there is tiredness, fatigue, and then headache, breathlessness, all these are the initial stages. Now the pallor of the eye is something important to see. The yellow pallor is something indicative of iron deficiency. And you can see that even when you open your hands, you will see it is yellow in color. So that indicates that there is less amount of hemoglobin in the body. So either a kind of complete blood, blood cell count measuring hemoglobin, if it is less than level, which is indicative of anemia, or you can look into the many other features of blood cell count to know whether you have any iron deficiency or is it that there is a deficiency of other nutrients causing anemia. So this is something important to discern between iron deficiency anemia and any anemia. Then comes the zinc deficiency, which is again a very important deficiency commonly seen primarily because this actually comes with the foods that are rich in um, kind of, I would say, most of those are the non-vegetarian products. So you will see unless people are eating whole grains and whole pulses, you may miss the sink in the diet or you may have to eat all kinds of um, nuts, oil seeds and non-vegetarian products. So it's important to ensure that these products are included to prevent the sink deficiency. Coming to iodine deficiency, this is one of the important things that is commonly seen in US. And there are many studies that is indicating that there is the intake of iodine is very low. And the implementation of uh, um, salt fortification was not a great thing for uh, Western side because there is a higher prevalence of hypertension as well. 
but the indication was that the food or food items, especially the bread and milk are fortified with iodine. But of late, we are seeing the re-emergence of iodine deficiency in US. So all of you, I request that please ensure that you are eating adequate amount of iodine because iodine deficiency influences the functioning of thyroid. And especially if you have young uh, girls at home who are pregnant or about to conceive, ensure that adequate amount of iodine is given. And even supplements are indicated if you are planning for a pregnancy. Now, the key points for the today's session is that um, micronutrients play a central part in the metabolism and maintenance of tissue function. And it is important to consume adequate amount of these nutrients to sustain the metabolism and tissue function. Providing excess supplements to people who do not need them may be harmful. This is what we don't recommend, actually. And the clinical benefit of micronutrient supplement is most probable in those who are severely depleted or at risk of complications. And it is unlikely if this is not the case. So any normal person without any disease, you should not take any kind of supplements. And many of the clinical trials have failed to show a benefit of supplements in reducing the incidence of infection in elderly population or coronary heart disease or in any kind of cancers or malignant disease. Supplements of zinc and vitamin A in children in developing countries have reduced the prevalence of diarrhea and pneumonia, but this is not the case with the elder population or adults. So, and also, even uh, people who are suffering from HIV, there is no clear benefit of supplementing them with micronutrients, although there are certain indications that some cases it helps actually, but then the help is minimum. Also, there is some evidence in the benefit of supplements on cognitive function. Now, I reiterate the role of iodine, and that is very, very important to consider. And this is actually important, except for iodine, others have not shown much benefit, um, and even among the elderly population. But it is important to maintain the normal level. Don't consume over the top of the supplements on a regular basis. In fact, that can harm the system. And also, there is good evidence of benefit in critical illness. This is where actually supplements are required. And even the selenium supplement is very important in case of very critical illnesses so that the recovery is faster when you use them. And also, most benefit is from micronutrients seems to be from a well-balanced diet compared to the supplement that we consume. Now, supplement is used only in case of prevention and treatment of diseases that requires clarification by clinical trials. So it is very, very important that we don't overdo with the supplements, but we just focus on through the food we consume as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Minan. Now the People can ask their doubts, questions. Yes, please unmute yourselves if you have any questions. I think in chat somebody put. So I see three questions here actually. So someone has said that I have osteoporosis and arthritis in mid 60s. I believe I need a calcium supplement, but what about the calcification? Also calcium and vitamin D absorption, how to increase? Now here, I would advise that don't overdo with supplements. There is no clear evidence as of now that in any condition, for example, unless you are very deficient, supplement will work. In case of people who have normal metabolism, and in case of people who have normal levels of calcium and vitamin D, you don't require a supplement. 
what is more important is you need to have a good exercise for your body. Whatever possible that you can start off with, you need to start off. I know it is a painful condition, but at the same time, sitting throughout the day is something that hamper and additional supplements are not going to help you. It is dangerous to take if you have any coexisting conditions. Now the hello. second, yeah, hello. Me, me Bharti, is, uh, I'm, uh, I'm talking about the uh, skin, uh, something like uh, insects bite and then like a uh, uh, bite and then they like a uh, bump like a bump and what kind of uh, deficiency vitamin deficiency to take so this uh, uh, this is not actually not an insect bite but they, they, this type of bump like an insect bite so what kind of uh, sometimes is a whole body and sometimes a different different place so what going to do so what you need to follow is like it is important what kind of yeah it is important to rule out first that it is not an infection second is you could if you are not consuming if your diet is not including any sources of antioxidants for example vitamin a vitamin c and polyunsaturated fatty acids in the in terms of essential fatty acids it is important that you consume those food items. For example, you could think of consuming a balanced diet that consists of green leafy vegetables, nuts, oil seeds, and probably you can take some amount of um, um, fish oil for a few days and see how it improves the scenario. It's, it's not allergy. It could be an allergy, but... Allergy is something differently need to be treated than nutrients alone. Maybe uh, one, uh, maybe two weeks uh, is uh, like uh, my granddaughter. She has a, a, like uh, some spot in light, um, no, not uh, like a red or uh, light uh, skin color spot, but uh, one day in the morning gone and the evening is uh, come again in different, different place. I suspect that is a kind of allergic reaction or an infection. So it needs to be shown to a doctor. Yeah, the doctor gave temporary medicine, but uh, uh, then they reduce everything. So uh, not go to allergy doctor, but uh, I, everything is okay. So uh, we are not going, but a uh, uh, couple of days we are waiting and watch. And then we take an appointment to allergy doctor. Sure, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. Now, I see another question, actually, how one can get accurate uh, blood tests done to find out what are deficient in what. So, um, if you want to test, you can test all this in the lab, actually. There are comprehensive tests available. Now, if you want to test for iron, there are battery of tests, like starting with complete blood cell account, and then you have serum ferritin. Vitamin D is available, B12 is available, and then other B vitamins are also available if needs to be tested. But um, I would suggest, unless you have some signs and symptoms, please don't go and keep testing because that is not going to help you. What is important is eating holistically, fresh, local, and seasonal kind of food items and we eat. Cook. We cook every day, and, but, but uh, one month in July or two August, uh, one month we went to India, uh, we all together. So that's why uh, some kind of infection or um, I don't know. Uh, that needs to be identified what is causing the infection or allergy. It could be just the body reaction to some kind of allergy. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Thank you, Bharti Antiji. And if I am taking medicine for cholesterol, should I be taking CoQ10? I would say, please refrain from any kind of supplements. The best thing to beat cholesterol is walking. 
please get up and walk. That actually helps a lot. There is adequate amount of literature and evidence that is available that cholesterol goes off if you reduce your body weight. I'm not sure the, how, what is the body status and all that. There are many things that we look at before we say this, but in general, if you are diabetic, if you are having cholesterol, if you are in the early stages of any kind of chronic disease, please exercise. There is no escape as much as you can and build your strength over a period of time. Reduce the excess fat from the body. Your, your entire disease will disappear. This is what the new science is indicating. Now, the next question is been from Bina Bateja. What about if someone had breast cancer, what type of vitamins to recommend? Now, Bina, I can't off, off the hand tell you what kind of vitamins would be beneficial, but I need to know more things about the stage of the disease and even um, what is the current scenario, what is the current status of the patient, unless I know that it would be too vague that I tell you that it is important that patients should not be malnourished. That would be a general statement. It would be too immature, to premature to say that the person, the cancer patient should never be malnourished. It is important to ensure that they are consuming adequate food. They will have challenges in consuming foods because the chemotherapy and the radiotherapy that they might be undergoing has a lot of adverse effects. Considering that this is the place where you require some supplements. Okay, the, uh, it's stage one, three years ago, a bilateral mastectomy, mm -hmm. no chemo, no radiation, nothing. Mm -hmm. So what does the patient do then? So if that is supplements. the case, what is the current status of the body? Is how, it's, how uh, currently all right, no problems, uh, walks at least three miles a day. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as I know, eats healthy. That is the most important thing. Eating healthy is very important. And the body weight. This is something very important, actually. If the person is obese, need to reduce the weight. Otherwise, eating healthy is the best option and less of stress. Lot of sunshine. Lot of sunshine. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have another question in the chat, uh, Dr. Man. Yeah, vitamin D is a sunshine and milk. Can you recommend any veggie for vitamin D? There are no vegetable sources for vitamin D. What you have is, yes, nuts. Nuts is good. Oils are good. Um, but you can't drink oil. That is That has to be used very sparingly. But in terms of vitamin D, please don't worry. Get out. Walk in the sun. It helps. It's a natural system. You don't have to worry at all, especially the time between 8 to 12 is the best to walk to get some vitamin D. Some of the Thank you very much. Is there any other questions? Please unmute, otherwise... The, uh... I, I don't see any other questions. Yes, Dr. Rao, you have anything to add up? Oh, thank you, Professor Mayan. And we'll be, we are very glad that we are hearing all these things from you directly. And hopefully we'll have continued interactions and benefit to the people. Thank you very much for accepting our offer and presenting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And indeed, it's a great